So welcome to the 1980s. We've arrived with Near Dark from 1987, actually a very well-known film uh, among vampire scholars and among film scholars generally. I think it's a pretty good film. Um, you may not have been as familiar with Near Dark, you might not have been in, on your radar, but I think Near Dark's worth watching and certainly worth talking about. So Near Dark is our first vampire western. Um, we're going to have some other ones that would probably qualify as a vampire western, but Near Dark is certainly the first one that we've watched and probably one of the first ones uh, that people tend to note. So vampire films generally often cross into other genres. They're very rarely just a straight vampire film. So the vampire western is actually quite popular. There have been several examples of vampire westerns over time, even one starring John Bon Jovi. Uh, vampire films also cross into science fiction, so you can see the atomic atom age vampire. And then uh, vampire films are also often comedies, and there's a, a one from the 80s starring Jim Carrey, and then some other examples of vampire films. I'm not sure what genres we would say Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter crosses over into, but again, an interesting kind of taking the vampire narrative and using it in a different way. So we know that Near Dark is a Western for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's setting, it's set in a very Western setting. You can see that in the, the fields that people work on and the kind of remoteness of everything. Uh, the cowboy hats are part of the costumes that people wear. So there are signals in what people are wearing and how they're acting that this is a Western uh, movie. The storyline is very, uh, very much a road movie if, uh, if you've ever heard that term. So people traveling around the West trying to get maybe nowhere in particular, but just traveling. And that's really what the vampires are doing. So you have characters, setting, costume, and story that all seem to put this film clearly in the, in the genre of the Western. So what Prince talks about uh, that is useful for us to think about is what we would call feminist filmmaking. So Near Dark was directed by Catherine Bigelow. You may have heard of her. She's a very well-known uh, female director and often associated with feminist filmmaking. So one of the things that Prince notes about Bigelow is that she works within traditional film forms. So she's not making just a bunch of love stories and what we commonly think of as, um, as films that are more geared towards women, the kind of chick flick, if you've ever heard that phrase before. Catherine Bigelow doesn't make those. And quite frankly, many chick flicks are directed by men anyway. But some of Catherine Bigelow's more famous films that you may have heard of include Zero Dark Thirty, The Hurt Locker, K-19, The Widowmaker, Point Break. Uh, so these are action movies, not, uh, not heavy story, love story kinds of movies. So for Prince and for others, you can think of Catherine Bigelow as a feminist filmmaker because she, in the narratives of her film, and if you look at some of those examples up there, there are actually strong female characters in those movies. Uh, as there are strong female characters in Near Dark. So you can think of that as one element of feminist filmmaking, that she has strong women in her films. But the other thing that you can think of in terms of feminist filmmaking is that Catherine Bigelow is herself a woman in a very male-dominated field. Uh, there are not many female directors that are very well known. So she would be an example of kind of empowering women within an industry as opposed to uh, just empowering them within the narrative of her movies. So for the article that we read by Large, um, Large considers uh, Near Dark to be a vampire Western. So for uh, Large, there are several examples in Near Dark that point to the Western motif. And I mentioned some of these before, but here are some more kind of concrete examples. So uh, there's the shootout which is pretty indicative of the Western. If you remember when they were kind of holed up at the, at the motel, uh, there the police come and there's a kind of massive shootout. And you've seen this in other Western movies, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the Young Guns movies. Somebody's trapped somewhere and there's a big shootout to where the police come and get them. So that's very much an image from a Western. There's the cowboy riding in on the white horse to save uh, to save the female. In this case, he's trying to save his sister, 
But ultimately, there he is. He's got his cowboy hat. He's got his lasso. He's got his horse. Uh, there's not much more that you need to see to tell you that this is a Western. And again, very different than some of the vampire films that we've watched so far. And then there's, of course, the bar scene. Uh, which is also indicative of the Western movie, the classic bar fight scene. And this scene is really more tied to the Western, much like the, the action fighting in Blackula said that this was a black exploitation movie. This really kind of testifies to it being a Western. They walk into a kind of seedy bar, beat up and kill a bunch of cowboys. Uh, so that, again, for large, this is imagery that, that really screams Western. And then if you look at what they're wearing, kind of the jeans and leather coats, I mean, they don't really dress like other kinds of vampires. They're really dressed more like bad guys in a classic Western film. So large uh, makes another point that's kind of interesting, that, uh, that there's a strong connection between Near Dark and the movie Alien. So Aliens was directed by James Cameron, who happened to be married to Catherine Bigelow. They are no longer married. But there are some allusions within the film itself, as well as some kind of concrete connections that we can point to. So in this scene, when he's kind of stumbling around trying to make it to the bus station, if you look closely at that marquee in the background, uh, it is a marquee for the movie Aliens, which again is not an, uh, an accident. Uh, there are very few things in films that happen by accident. Most everything that is put in a scene has been put there for a reason, and in this particular case, uh, this is kind of an allusion to the movie Aliens. If you look at the cast of Near Dark, uh, there's the cast of Near Dark as seen on Internet Movie Database. And then if you look at the cast of Aliens, again, also from Internet Movie Database, you can see that there are quite a few people that appear in both. And there are probably more bit actors that don't even kind of make this top list that ended up in both movies, but those are three of the biggest ones that you can see are in both movies. Large also thinks that uh, Near Dark really breaks with the traditional vampire movie. Uh, that There are elements of the vampire movie that are missing, uh, including uh, the actual word vampire is never mentioned, and there's a strong love story in here, and that uh, for Large is different than a kind of uh, traditional vampire movie and that the actual narrative of Near Dark is really about a love story as opposed to being about just vampires. So Near Dark, like a lot of our other movies, has some interesting puns or jokes throughout the movie. Uh, you can see in the very, very opening scene, right after the, the opening credits, there's a shot of a mosquito. And we all know mosquitoes like to suck on people's blood. And that's kind of a joke about vampires and mosquitoes. I don't think the joke is that these are really mosquitoes running around killing people. We know they're vampires, but there's that connection in blood sucking right away. When, uh, when we first have our, our first encounter early in the movie, uh, there's the joke, can I have a bite? Referring to the ice cream that May is eating, but we all know when you say, can I have a bite? And you're talking to a vampire that that has a completely different meaning. If you listen closely when they're burning the RV, uh, somebody shouts, you know, reminds me of that fire we set in Chicago, referring to the great Chicago fire, implying that they were there because vampires don't age and don't die. Obviously they die. Uh, if you do certain things to them, but they don't die just because they're old and they're implying that they set the Chicago fire, uh, the great Chicago fire, which is kind of, again, another joke. And then the name of the motel, uh, the final motel, the Godspeed motel, uh, is, I think, a pun, uh, a joke that, you know, these are, this is kind of the anti-God group staying at the Godspeed motel. So I think that's intended to be just another kind of visual linguistic joke within this movie. So there are some connections that we can make to traditional vampire narratives. So it's not as though Near Dark dispenses completely with the vampire narrative. Uh, we see here, and we will see more in later films, animals don't seem to like vampires. In this particular case, horses don't like vampires, but we will see other animals later on that don't like vampires. And that's an interesting motif that, um, that still is present in Near Dark. The cut hand we have seen in quite a few movies and the vampire kind of being drawn to the cut hand. We don't actually see an attack here based on the cut hand, but clearly 
uh, he is he smells the blood and is interested in it. So that that's that's another connection to the other vampire films that we've seen so far. We all know that in vampire films, sunlight hurts, and we can see uh, Caleb stumbling around. He's smoking. It's not as easy to see in that shot, but he is smoking. Anytime you see someone uh, kind of not in flames in this movie, but kind of smoking, you can see they're kind of wearing a heavy jacket. And I'm sure that's because there's a, a fair amount of not necessarily pyrotechnics under that coat, but something is making him smoke. So the characters tend to have a heavy coat on when they start smoking. Uh, but again, sunlight damages vampires. So we don't have some of the trappings of vampires, fangs, and things like that, but we all know that, that sunlight is a problem for vampires. And then when vampires are destroyed by sunlight, it's fairly dramatic. I would argue that Near Dark, among our films, is probably the first really dramatic uh, depiction of the vampire being destroyed by sunlight. So uh, vampires catch fire, and then ultimately vampires explode in, in this film, and in some of our later films, due to sunlight. So it's pretty dramatic, uh, high special effects action movie kind of stuff here. But we know this is because they are vampires and they're being destroyed by sunlight. In addition, the shootout that we see, you know, it's not the bullets that hurt them. It's the sunlight that comes in through the bullet holes that hurts them. So that's, again, a, a kind of traditional way to look at the vampire. You may have noticed uh, Troy Evans made me an appearance in this movie. He's what I like to call a classic that guy. He is often a police officer, as he is in this movie, uh, kind of uh, harassing Caleb at the bus station. Of course, he looks kind of sick and kind of out of it, so it seems almost appropriate that a police officer would, uh, would want to know what's going on. But if you need to see him in, as a police officer in other movies, you can watch any number of movies, made-for-TV movies, miniseries, TV shows. He is often a police officer. Uh, or an authority figure of some kind. Sometimes he's in the military. But just these films alone, he is, uh, he is a police officer in each of these films. There was actually a, an interesting documentary that I watched called That Guy Who Was In That Thing about actors like Troy Evans uh, that pop up in a bunch of movies. They're highly recognizable, but they're not, they're not first build actors. We don't know their names. We often forget what we've seen them in. And uh, that was a really great documentary, and I streamed it on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's still there, but it's definitely worth watching. Uh, it's both interesting and sad in a, in a kind of way when you look at what these actors have to do to get, uh, to get work and to survive in Hollywood when they're not Brad Pitt and they're not uh, Morgan Freeman. You know, They're not the actor in the movie, but they're just a kind of bit person in a movie or television show. But they still, many of them, make a good living doing that. So definitely a, a documentary worth watching. So one of the things that's interesting about Near Dark is we start to see the vampire family form. So we kind of have the mother and father and the children. And this picture uh, kind of is the, you know, you could imagine a picture like this hanging on a wall, the kind of framed family picture. Obviously one person has her back to the camera, so it's not an ideal picture, but it really is kind of the framing of the family. They are very much a family traveling around in this film. So we will see later vampire families. They don't all look the same, but it's important to note this particular kind of vampire family in Near Dark. So as we've noted in, in some of our articles and some of our other films, vampires, we don't often see them have uh, inter intercourse or sexual relations like you would in many other films. But in this film, there are a couple of key moments where we see vampires essentially having sex with each other. And um, it's usually in this kind of feeding process. So if you listen uh, to the sound effects, there's kind of a heavy heartbeat, and you look at the way in which characters are reacting. If you didn't know um, that this is what was going on in terms of feeding and just took some of those screenshots out of context, uh, it would look like very much like a sex scene in, a, in another movie. And then, of course, this scene, again, I would argue is, is sort of vampire intercourse. And the oil derricks in the background are really kind of, for lack of a better term, driving it home. Uh, that kind of symbolism is not an accident. 
So here they are having sex, and then you have these these big machines that are very phallic in nature in the background. So I would argue that these are both examples of kind of what we would think of as perverse vampire intercourse, because it's not intercourse like we would think of. So this is one of the ways that vampires are different. Uh, these are the kinds of things they do with each other that don't fit into our heteronormative uh, perspective of, uh, of either intercourse or sexuality generally. There are a couple things that I find uh, interesting in uh, Near Dark. So I like that in the beginning of the movie they're driving around in this Winnebago. We don't see as many of these anymore, this kind of RV. But I would argue, you know, this is the most conspicuous vehicle they could have chosen. How they are not uh, chased down and arrested right away. That someone couldn't find this vehicle in a hot minute. Uh, I find pretty kind of funny. And then, of course, they get rid of this vehicle early in the film. But clearly they've been driving it around for a while. And I think it's, it's funny that no one seems to notice this, you know, vampire-driven, windows-blacked-out RV that's pulling people off the street. Uh, the film also teaches us about hitchhiking, that that's a bad idea. So uh, I, I find it funny when the two women, uh, uh, you know, find this hitchhiker appealing. Uh, I think most people would probably drive right past him. He looks a little shady. And then, of course, that's followed not long after the kind of evil hitchhikers uh, that, uh, that try to kind of carjack them later. And, you know, we all know what happens to that. But then, of course, there's a truck driver that picks up. Um, and Caleb. So there are all these instances of um, of bad things happening when you pick up hitchhikers. So if you if you learn nothing else from Near Dark, um, it's don't pick up hitchhikers. There's an important difference in uh, Near Dark relative to our other vampire films. So what Near Dark leaves us with is that vampirism is something that can be cured. And we haven't seen that before. So we see these kind of blood transfusions uh, kind of unturning people from being a vampire. Um, and we see at least, you know, we see two instances of that where, you know, if you put good blood in where the vampire blood is, uh, you won't have an evil person anymore. You won't have a vampire. And we're left at the end with this kind of, here's some daylight uh, hitting May and she's fine. And She's this kind of redeemable character at the end, uh, but it has been a killer throughout the film and has killed many people, presumably both before we saw her and during the time that she was traveling with that group because uh, they need to feed. And it's interesting that, um, that she's kind of redeemed at the end. She's cured of being a vampire and forgiven for all of these horrible things that she did, which undoubtedly includes murdering people in a kind of gruesome way. So again, you could think of that as, you know, maybe that's part of the feminist message of Near Dark, that that this female character can be redeemed. Um, we know Caleb doesn't kill anyone, so he doesn't need redemption in that way. He does need to be cured of the disease of being a vampire, but ultimately um, he doesn't he doesn't have the same kind of baggage that May has in terms of what she's done. But the film wraps it up nicely at the end and says they're both cured, no one's a vampire anymore, the other vampires are dead, and, and everyone's happy. So what are the key takeaways from Near Dark? Well, first, uh, Near Dark is an example of feminist filmmaking, and we've talked about why Prince argues that and why other people would argue that as well. Uh, we've seen examples of Near Dark as a Western, kind of a vampire-Western hybrid. So keep in mind the reasons in which the near dark can be characterized in that way. Uh, there are traditional elements of, of vampire movies missing here. So uh, you don't hear anyone called a vampire. The vampires don't dress like vampires. They don't have fangs like vampires. So that's that's an interesting difference between near dark and uh, and some of the other movies that we'll watch and have watched. Uh, there are still some of the standard vampire elements though so it's not completely devoid of, of what we think of as a vampire film so that's it's important to keep in mind what's missing and what's actually there and for the first time we see that that vampires can be cured vampires can be restored back uh, to being human and that is a theme that does not pop up often in vampire films and something to keep in mind as you think about where near dark fits uh, relative to a lot of the other films that we watch